You're listening to And you're listening to Books and Bobo, a book club, a podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And welcome back to our June mid month check in. On this episode, we'll be talking about the latest book news、um, happening in Asian American literature.、Um, as always, thanks to Rira for putting together the list that we're going to be going through.、Um, I don't know, it's a little bit shorter this month, huh? Yeah, it is. I think we covered a lot of ground in the, in the last.、Uh... Two episodes where we briefly covered news. So there there aren't a lot of book deals, but、um, some big piece of news happened、uh, earlier last week. And we're probably going to talk mostly about that. <laughs>、um, if you're into the Asian American community, if you're plugged in, you probably know what it is. And、um, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about what happened with Nono Boy and Penguin Classics this past week. So, Marvin, have you made any headway into this month's book?、Um, no, I have not started. And for those of you who don't know what this month's book club pick is, it's Haruki Murakami's Kafka on the Shore. Our first Murakami. Yes, our very first Murakami book <laughs> that either of us have ever read in our lives. I have it. It's loaded up in my Kindle. I'm ready to read it.、Uh, just this past week has been filled with、um, following video game news. Yeah, yeah,、uh, same here. I had. <laughs> I just got my copy、um, yesterday in the mail because、yeah. I wanted to own it. But there was、um, the, the cover that is mostly used now, the, the,、um, the paperback that is most popular, it's the Vintage International cover. And、uh -huh. that's, that's the cover that you have, Marvin, which is ugly and bluish gray. It's not the one with the face on Goodreads, right? No, no, it is not the one.、Um, With the face on Goodreads here, I'll show you my cover. So I went on Amazon to find this very specific cover、oh. because I really did not want the ugly cover because <laughs> this is going on my bookshelf. So I got the one where the cover is black and there's a black cat on a, on a red circle that kind of looks like a profile of a face. It kind of looks like the Thundercats. Like、oh, it、logo. does. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how far I go when it comes to、uh, getting the editions I like for、This、my is bookshelf. True. Because when I was in China, I went to their, like, one of the, their only Western bookstores and I was showing the covers of all like, the international versions and you're really geeking out about it. Yes.、Uh, the Three Dark Crowns, they, they have like manga esque. Oh, that's、uh, pretty covers. badass. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that series is by Kendara Blake. And、uh, yeah, it's about three, pretty, three queens kind of fighting for the ultimate throne. And, right. Yeah. It's, it's, really, it's a really badass series. And <laughs> I was really upset that they did not have those、uh, options here in America. I know, right? I feel like it just pops, like, because the, the cover in the American version is just a crown. It's like three crowns, three dark crowns. Yeah.、Right? <laughs> Uh, anyway, yeah,、um, Marvin and I are really into video games.、Yeah. So,、um, most of our time this past week has just been catching up on E3 news.、Um, <laughs> Watching people watch press conferences. You know what? And... That is the only way I can watch E3 now. I can't watch the press conferences、yeah. by itself because <laughs> I can't take them seriously. <laughs> we should really have, like, maybe, like we said, as like, As a perk. bonus content, <laughs> us just talking about other forms of media because we do more than just read. That's true. And to our detriment, sometimes we, <laughs> we, we postpone a lot of things because we end up playing video games or、uh, some other interest. Binge TV.、Yeah. Or, Binge TV,、yeah. Killing Eve, you know.、Um, if, if you are into us talking about more video games, Uh, just let us know on Twitter so we can just gauge. <laughs> like, <laughs> we just do a whole new games and. I just, I just want to know like,、yeah. how, um, 
like if anyone is interested or if it's just us talking about it and like no one listening to us we are merging our fandoms right now i know uh but yeah what's been going on in the world of book news in asian american literature all right we're gonna start with our only book deal um, amongst our book news uh crown books has acquired ellen o's middle grade novel the colliding worlds of mina lee along with a second untitled ya novel in the book's Mina Lee is transported into her own webcomic only to find that none of her characters are doing what they're supposed to. Publication of the first book is set for summer 2021. And this is Ellen O of uh, We Need, we Need Diverse, Diverse Books, Books fame, right? Yes. Awesome. Congratulations to Ellen. Um, this sounds like fun. Like I'm always glad to see more diversity in like YA fiction. I'm more excited for middle grade fiction actually. I feel oh, yeah? I feel like more diversity has kind of seeped into that that like mm. tier of uh, readers, and that's great because you're starting at a much younger age, that's teaching true. kids empathy, teaching kids uh, th- uh, about the world, really. So that's really great. Yeah, and I kind of feel like it's is it easier because like like youth fiction as with like genre fiction, it's easier to kind of incorporate diversity in there because. You're not playing with conventions and like the rules. I I'm not sure. Um, from a lot of a lot of authors who write YA, they also write adult novels, mm. or they their original YA novel was actually pitched as an adult novel until mm. marketing changed it. I feel like YA has become like like so I don't know saturated, and no one really quite knows like who it's for anymore <laughs> like originally it's it was for teens who um because like the main characters in why novels are usually like 16 to maybe like 21 years old right they're like um it's, they're all coming of age stories yeah they're all coming yeah. of age stories usually they're fast-paced usually um like i don't know like it, it reads much faster and more concentrated than like a literary fiction novel, for example. Mm. I feel like a lot of literary fiction novels I have read has been like more sprawling and more um, like um, it's more of like character study rather than like fast paced action right. or rom com uh rom rom com streamlined story storylines. But right, they they feel more cinematic right yeah, in terms yeah. of like the the way the stories are told and of course like it depends on genres like it depends if it's like sci-fi or yeah. like fantasy or whatnot they're like the cw of the liter like of the literary I, world I, I would really argue against that because there are there are a lot of ya novels that read like adult novels to me mm. and uh, a lot of ya novels that are better than a lot of literary fiction that i've read in my life and well, i feel like a lot of the fans of ya that we know of are like our age which which comes with its uh positives and negatives because mm. also like we as adults are invading like a uh, space of teenagers and I mean, i'm still playing video games so <laughs> I, I i wouldn't say like invading but like what i feel like a lot of goodreads reviewers who uh review like ya books who are like o- over the age of 30 yeah like sometimes the comments that they the the reviews that they leave especially the negative ones they say oh i couldn't relate to this character Mm. and it's like you're not supposed to you're not the main demographic and it's okay to you know yeah not enjoy the book because of that but also like to go on goodreads (laughs) and to like kind of trash a book because of that is it is like terrible and also because because like more and more adults are reading YA novels because it's a lot faster to read, like I feel like a lot of the teens who are reading YA, their voices are kind of being subdued and mm. marketing and like publicists, they're not really engaging with them as much as they should. Yeah. I don't know. Th- like this is me. Um, <laughs> like th- this is my take on it as someone who is like an amateur uh, like, like I, I'm not an industry expert, and I definitely don't hey, keep up. We have a podcast. <laughs> Everyone has a podcast, but I like, like I said, I'm not an industry expert, and I definitely don't read as much as uh, professional book bloggers. 
um, do. But that is just my personal take on it. And it would be really interesting to bring someone who is like a publicist or a publisher or an editor and just talk more about this topic. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a valid take. And I think, I mean, I know we're on Goodreads, but sometimes like Goodreads is pretty much just Yelp for books, right? The only time when it becomes like really um, detrimental is when the Goodread reviews, like really popular Goodread reviewers will um, give a book like one or two stars based on just that. Like, oh, mm. I didn't relate to the character or I didn't learn this from this culture that this book is promoting. So therefore, it only gets two stars. Or they say, oh, they just ripped off like their own history of like of this, yeah. of this Chinese dynasty. These what, names blah, blah, sound blah. fake. No one's named Twinkle. <laughs> yeah, like stuff like that. And then it affects like how like if it affects like other people who like who might want to read it like yeah. they might say okay well this person is saying it's bad so maybe i won't read it or they'll go in with already a prejudice in in their head headspace so yeah yeah there there's a lot of <laughs> good reads wow that is a totally separate episode we should do that is another <laughs> freaking like ted talk yeah just hang out at books and boba the group on goodreads and just chat with us so it's, it's a lot nicer. I, okay. I promise. All right. So yeah, we're going to congratulations <laughs> to Ellen O on her book deal. Um, excited for you, and would love to talk to you one of these days just yes. about your work on both writing and promoting diverse literature. Hit us up. Moving on to news. Sharp Objects creator Marty Noxon and executive producer Jessica Rhodes have optioned the film and TV rights to Abdi Nazamian's YA novel, Like a Love Story. So Like a Love Story, it's a YA novel that follows three teens living in New York City during the AIDS crisis in uh, 1989, early 90s. Oh. And um, it centers on Riza, who is an Iranian boy um, who is... Who is uh, who is still closeted as um, as a gay teen, and um, but but he's very he's afraid he's very afraid to come out because this is during the AIDS crisis and right. the only uh, gay figures that he knows um, have like have been gay men with AIDS and um, and then there's another teenager named Judy who is an aspiring fashion designer and uh, her uncle is. A gay man with AIDS, and she devotes her time with activism. And Judy falls for Riza. And of course, that has complications because right. Riza is gay. And then the third teenager that the story focuses on is um, Art, who is Judy's best friend and um, the school's only out and proud teen. And um, Riza and Art grow closer together. And, um, of course, that is kind of like an awkward love triangle situation. Yeah. So uh, it it sounds very, um, of of course, it is very coming of age. Yeah. And a lot I, of drama. A lot of it's drama a- <clears throat> will make for a very good TV or film. Yeah. So congratulations. Yeah, that sounds super interesting. You know, typically these stories focus on, like, the societal pressures. Um, but it sounds like Riza, the main character, also has like cultural pressures too. Yeah, yeah. No, that would be interesting. Which is which is nice, you know. You have a queer teen of color. Yeah. Next up, we have the Lambda Literary Award winners. Um, so here are the winners who are of Asian descent. Because <laughs> that's all we care about. That, no, that is not <laughs> okay. Well, this is the focus of the podcast. But congratulations to all of the winners. You can. <laughs> You can find the list of winners on Bustle and also at the Lambda Literary Award website. But <laughs> I am just going to go through the winners. That... I'm sure they're all fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go through the winners that uh, match the focus of this podcast. So for lesbian fiction, um, congratulations to Larissa Lai, the author of The Tiger Flu. And for Best Bisexual Fiction, we have Disoriental by Nagar Javadi. And uh, the winner for Bisexual Poetry is We Play a Game by Dui Duan. And for LGBTQ Drama, we have Draw the Circle by Mashuk Mushtaq Dean. 
last but not least, we have uh, for LGBTQ erotica, we have Miles and Honesty in SCFSX by Blue Deliquanti and Kazimir Lee. Wow. Congrats to all the award winners that, let's just say, I care about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, your words, not mine. Also, <laughs> I apologize for any mispronunciations. Yeah, that's all the big news that has happened since our last check-in. Um, as always, if you if there's anything that pops up um, that you want to get on our radar for the next news roundup, or you want to just let people know about, there is a news thread um, going on our Goodreads forums under the news desk uh, category, I guess. So if you see anything that you want to bring to our attention, uh, feel free to post there and we'll, we'll do our best to uh, highlight it in our next episode. Also, if you find anything on Twitter, you can tag us at Books and Boba. Yeah, that too. All right, moving on to... I guess the biggest piece of news yes. in our world. I was um, trying to think of like an idiom, but it just... I, I was about to say elephant in the room, but that wasn't it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, I mean, so we mentioned... The Penguin Classics re-release of a like four, like revered Asian American quote unquote classics, right? Like classical books that are basically taught in every Asian American studies course. One of which includes John Okada's No No Boy, which I remember reading when I took Asian American literature. It is the first Japanese American novel, right? Yeah, written in English. Yeah, it was written by John Okada. Um, who was part of the mass incarceration of Japanese Americans in World War II, um, he wrote it within 10 years of coming out of the camps. And it didn't really take off because it was a very that, that was a very traumatic time for the JA community. So I think people were just like, why are you writing about this stuff? Yeah, and I think, I think everyone yeah. really wanted to move on from the, from the war. So yeah. it was definitely uh, timing. And actually, uh, Okada based the the main character in the novel from a friend, like on a friend uh, yeah. who was sent to prison for refusing uh, the draft. Right. Because Okada himself was not a no-no boy. No. He, um, he served in the 442nd. He fought in, I think he served in the Pacific Theater actually as a translator. Yeah, as a translator. Yeah. yeah. Which actually meant he probably didn't serve in the 442nd because that was, yeah. they, they served in the German theater. Oh, okay. The Euro European right. theater. Yeah. But he, he was in Japan during uh, the brief U.S. Uh, occupation. occupation. Yeah. Um, but for people who don't know, and I can't remember the exact numbers of the the questions, but no, no boy refers to people who answered no to two questions in basically this um, survey that was sent out in the camps to essentially draft Japanese Americans into um, the U U.S. Army. One of them asked whether they would um, they would serve in the U.S. Army, and the other one asked would they declare absolute loyalty to the United States. And most people said yes, because they were really eager to show that they were Americans. But there w was a significant number of people who put no on both of those, because in their minds, like, as Americans, because a, a lot more U.S.-born citizens, they shouldn't be asked these questions while they're being incarcerated. Um, and again, I, I'm paraphrasing my limited knowledge of this period in time but there was a lot of like a lot of the the draft resistors the normal boys were ostracized in the community because they essentially were like you're just proving to them that we're not loyal loyal yes and there's a lot of like this, this tension there that now that we're reading we realize how like how much this whole mass incarceration like really fucked people up we're also seeing history repeat itself now, in, kind of, in, yeah. in like the current uh, political climate with immigration and incarceration of children. Yeah. But it is such a cornerstone in Asian American literature, which yeah. is why <laughs> it is taught in every single Asian American literature class, like you said. Yeah, because it's not a story about immigration or about like expectations from parents. Mm -hmm. It's about like this really messed up thing that happened to people because of their otherness. And how people dealt with that. And it was one of the first books to talk about the internment camps in fiction in a very direct way. Right? There's not a lot of fiction from that time period about this stuff. There's a couple more these days, but they were all written by people who weren't there. 
or uh, written by the children yeah. of, of um, those who were interned yeah. or um, they're very academic books mm -hmm. that are mostly just about history, which are very, very important. But like fiction. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like <laughs> fiction hits you uh, where like, I don't know, I, I like to me, fiction sinks in more than nonfiction. Yeah. I don't know, maybe it's because I get into, like, the character's mindset or role or what, whatever. But Yeah, I mean, we were um, <clears throat> forced. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we, we were required to read Pharaoh the Manzanar in high school, which is a memoir. So it's not exactly fiction. It's more nonfiction. But even that is, like, not a standardized requirement in, like, the country, right? That was extra reading for my middle school class. Mm. And I was like, sure, I'll read this. <laughs> and uh, that was the first time I knew about Japanese internment. And it's kind of horrifying because I was uh that was elective <laughs> reading and it's like, what the fuck, man? Like <laughs> like that should have been mandatory reading if it covered such an yeah. important part of US history. I think in California it's I don't know if it's still required, but it's on like the 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 list of books that you assign like your sophomore high school class. Well, I went. I went to elementary and middle school in the East Coast, so uh, in the South, right? Okay. Well, well, I, I moved to Georgia in like towards the tail end of middle school, okay. so most of my uh, childhood was spent in the East Coast. Mm. So yeah, um, but yeah. very far removed. Why from... are we talking about No No Boy? So we we are talking about No No Boy because um, recently. I think it was for Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. So it was in May. Mm -hmm. And uh, Penguin Random House released a couple of titles by um, Asian American authors. Yeah, these were the books that we saw our friend Phil and Christine unbox that we were like, why didn't we, we get them? We were like, some? why didn't we get them? <laughs> um, but so like John Okada's, uh, John Okada's No No Boy was one of the novels. And uh, they got caught into this copyright dispute because Penguin Random House says that um, No No Boy is under public domain, uh, whereas, um, okay, like, I, it's hard to explain this because we have to, like, go through the history of how No No Boy became published and right. how it became, uh, like, a requirement in Asian American yeah. literature. So what happened is, okay. Oh. <laughs> I mean, so... Okay, so No No Boy was published actually in Japan through a Japanese publisher. It was printed in English language, and it was printed um, under Tuttle pu Publishing back in 1957. Right, this was the first edition. This was the very first edition, and it did not do well. Right. Um, and a couple of years later, uh, Sean Wong, who is now an English professor at University of Washington, uh, he and his friends, they discovered Okada's book in a used bookstore uh, in 1971. This is why I support your local bookstores. Yes. And <laughs> uh, they were like, wow, this is like this is a really important novel because it was like the first novel that they've come across that talked about uh, Japanese internment. Mm -hmm. So uh, they went to publishers see, like asking if they would be willing to republish the book. And most of the publishers said no. There is no like interest. Who in is this, this who's, for? Who is gonna read this? Who wants to read about Japanese Americans? And uh, so what happened was uh, Sean Wong and his friends Jeffrey Paul Chan, Frank Chin, and Lawson Fusao Inada, they sold the copies themselves. They only sold like maybe. Uh, I'm I'm guessing here around like six thousand copies, mm -hmm. and um. Eventually, in 1976, Wong copyrighted the novel on behalf of Dorothy Okada. Right, because the author had passed away. Because the author had passed away from a heart attack when he was around uh, 47. So he passed away very young. Yeah, I think he passed away like literally just before Sean and his friends discovered his novel. Yes. Right. Yeah, I, I, I think so. Um, but Wong copyrighted the novel um, on behalf of the widow of John Okada for uh, the CARP edition of the novel. And CARP stands for a Combined Asian American Resources Project. And that was the um, the group that him and his friends used to get 
the second printing done. Yes,、right? yes. So they pretty much got people to buy the book within the community by advertising on、um, a Japanese American newspaper,、yeah. offering like two dollar discounts. And and it's important to note that this was probably the same time that the whole reparations debate was like in full force. Right? I, I don't know the exact time frame, so I may be wrong. But this was a time when Sansei, like third generation Japanese Americans, were Starting to realize that internment happened because this wasn't something the community talked about, and like the Nisei and、um, and Issei were like a lot of them were actually trying to just like forget about it and, and like bury it. Yeah, very like it, it was a very crucial time、yeah. <laughs> in, in terms of like recovering from the war, and、um, it was a time when the next generation was. Kind of discovering that there was this really messed up thing that their country did to their、yes. families, and they wanted they wanted to learn more. Yeah, and、um, so like they sold the books themselves、uh, under CARP,、mm-hmm. and they transferred the rights in 1979 to the University of Washington Press, who is still、uh, the publishers of yeah、uh, of the book.、And、so I got my copy back in 2005. So I'm assuming I have one of the University it's, of Washington it's Press ones from、yeah. University of Washington Press, and they've been、uh, keeping the book in print for more than 40 years, and. Uh, all of the they do pay royalties to the Okada family, so they handle all of the rights and the、mm-hmm. royalties.、Um, but Penguin, when they announced that they were、uh, doing the Asian American classics, they apparently、um, said that the book is under public domain in the U.S. and、uh, because it wasn't. Properly registered,、uh, the 1957 edition of the novel was not properly registered. Yeah, I think their argument is that the copyright from 1976 only covers the updated forward. Yeah, only the, book, the forward, but not the, the actual text, which was,、um, which because the original book was released in 1957 in public domain because it, it was like 50 years, 60 years. Yes, is、uh, the. Statute limitations on that,、um, and it's like very very complicated because、uh, No No Boy was published through a Japanese publisher, but、yeah. Okada is an American citizen, and also the U.S. wasn't part of the Berne Convention, which is also like kind of in charge of、um, of like. Pretty much copyrights from different countries. I mean, we were just talking about like cyberpunk capitalism running rampant, and this is like, <laughs> like the optics of this is, is all bad because it's like, okay, so you are essentially punishing this scrappy group of people trying to preserve this seminal work because John Okada had to go through a Japanese publisher because America wasn't ready for this book back then. Yeah, you know, um, and um. Dorothea Okada, who is John Okada's daughter,、uh, she spoke to the New York Times, and she said that her family was unaware of any issues with、um, copyright issues, and that the fa- family wasn't contacted by Penguin before the new edition was published. Right. So that is the main. <laughs> <laughs> right. So they weren't aware of any copyright issue because they weren't aware Penguin was publishing this book until they announced it. Yes, so pretty much Penguin just kind of went ahead because they're like it's in public domain. Like we have the rights to publish this under our、um, which publishing house,、yeah. and they didn't go ahead and get auth- authorization from the Okada family, even or even though, blessing. Yeah, the blessing, like、right? the thing is, like yeah, maybe legally speaking, they didn't need it, and they could have just like gone through with it, which they did. But the right thing. To have、yeah. done was to ask the family first. I mean, they may have they may have the legal right of way, so to say, but this just reeks of like bad faith business. I will doing, I will、right? read a quote that they、uh, gave to the New York Times. This is their statement: We acted in good faith to pursue No No Boy for publication. Our intent is to continue important conversations around No No Boy through its inclusion in the Penguin Classic series. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Penguin is a corporation. Corporation have PR people on retainer to like do these statements, and just because they say it's in good faith, like the the、If、fact it, that it, the, yeah, the fact that they didn't even ask the family that、yeah. is that is the f- first step in any good faith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ask first, and like who has the rights, and like maybe even looking into the history of this specific. 
book because because the history of getting this book published is probably like equally important as the work itself. I mean, it could be its own. I mean, yeah, they make movies about like discovering this old text of someone who like you know passed away, thinking no one wanted to read it, right? Yeah. This book is so important to the community, and the community really fought for this book to be published. It exists, and it is in classrooms because of the community and a corporation just picking that up and not understanding like the gravity of the situation yeah. is is kind of like ridiculous. And um, the thing is, so penguins penguins argument that. The 1957 edition is, you know, now public domain because the only part that is protected by copyright, uh, copyright law is the foreword. Right. Um, but the thing is, there's proof that Penguin appropriated from the UW Press edition. One sign is the John Akata signature at the end of um, the, the preface, preface, which is which was a typo because. He... It was it wasn't a typo, but like it it like his name was on there as mm. if it was like nonfiction, like as if oh. the story was a memoir, and it's not. It's completely <laughs> fiction, right? And they fixed that error in later editions, but this error only showed up in the 2014 redesign <laughs> of the book, and that's the that's the book with um, right the, the blue cover with with Jillian Tamaki's. Uh, um, illustration on it. So for those of you following along, that means that they had they because they probably they don't have the original manuscript or the original 1957 version. No, they scanned the most like they scanned the, the most early, readily available, yeah, the yeah. readily available copy of this book, and they just ran with it. And like that was like a crucial error in in uh, No No Boy that University yeah. of Washington like removed from all of their subsequent <laughs> editions. So it's just like, wow, you didn't even go through the effort of fixing a mistake that was caught on pretty early. Yeah. Like and then and then there's also the fact that they lifted a quote from Ruth Ozeki's forward mm. in one of the University of Washington presses edition. I think it was the same one, the 2014 edition. They lifted a quote from there. And I'm uh. like, she didn't give that to you. Like, <laughs> yeah. So it's like they say that because it's public domain and because like the only thing that is protected is the foreword, they still lifted things that, yeah, like that weren't a part <laughs> of the, like, it, I don't know how to explain this other than the fact that it just feels like Penguin Random House. Like, copied someone's like homework yeah i mean but not in a good way they like missed answers on the scantron the uh, the, the the overall story here is penguin did something shitty that wasn't against the rules per se but still pretty shitty and now they're trying to explain oh but we follow the rules so we're cool right and i think their official statement was that they are reaching out to the okada family or the okada estate to talk terms i guess but like but there has been no confirmation on yeah. whether or not the Okada family is going to get any royalties from the Penguin Random House sales, right. which I think, like, it's never going to happen because <laughs> <laughs> it's a big corporation. But it would be, like, a gesture of goodwill if they just yeah. went ahead and did that anyway. So there's now two versions of this book out in circulation. There is the authorized by the family University of Washington Press version and there's the unauthorized corporate penguin version and a bunch of um really well-known Asian American authors who are also professors at a lot of universities yeah. like Viet Tuen uh, Viet Tien Nguyen who um you know he read uh he he's the author of the sympathizer which we read for this uh book club he said that he will only use the University of Washington Press's yeah. copies for his class. And um, a lot of other Asian American authors said the same thing. Um, so it seems like it's kind of like a across-the-board decision by the Asian American community to only use the... Yeah, I mean, for people who have been, te who have been teaching Asian American studies, like this is like, this is the book you assign in your one-on-one class, right? To illustrate... To talk about this specific period in time. And so it is in a lot of classrooms and it is being, it gets assigned a lot, especially um, like, you know, not in every school because not every school has Asian American studies, but 
it's one of the books like I, I would say even above like Joy Luck Club, right? It's, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, like it's a book that you, I mean, every class, every class, it's it's this, it's Woman Warrior, and some Navy Speaker. America's I think. the heart. Yeah, and it tarnishes like the goodwill that Penguin built for having this collection in the first place. I'm, I'm not right? saying that like. Penguin is evil because they they have plenty of very talented and dedicated Asian American editors, agents, and authors under their belt. They are trying really hard to promote diversity and to um, and to introduce diversity to their young readers. But you know, like corporations make mistakes. Yeah, and like this is this is a really big one. But corporations also don't like admitting it. That's true right. for legal reasons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So it it just feels like this is what happens when a corporation like does make a mistake but aren't allowed to really have a good faith argument about it because of all the lawyers and all the PR people that are involved now. Yeah, I know I know that when like the Penguin Classics edition was announced, people were very very excited that these books were now going under like a big publisher. Yeah. And it it's really sad that like Okada's legacy which should have been celebrated for Asian American uh Pacific Heritage Month, like that kind of got tarnished by this copyright like dispute yeah. and it's like, oh, what a bummer. Like <laughs> Like, this was supposed to be a moment where we're like, yes, we, quote unquote, made it. We have classics now. <laughs> we like, have, yeah, we have classics now. We're th- like, we're are, like dead white people. <laughs> that, are, that are recognized by a corporation publishing house. It, it's a big deal. Mm. And, you know, it, it is really disappointing. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, if you have thoughts about th- this issue or... Thoughts about Nono Boy in general, um, please let us know on our Goodreads forums. We'd love to um, hear your thoughts and chat with you about this as well. Um, it's been it's been a while since we've had like one of these like issues that like kind of took over Uh-oh. Twitter for a bit, you know. <laughs> uh oh, the pot got too hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's important because like we were said, the story of this book being published is Essentially, the same. It's the same story we've been having. It's it's the same like narrative that we've been dealing with of like representation and what like what it took for this story to even make it in the classrooms was like a really gargantuan effort because like this book could have easily just been lost to time. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and it was for for a number of years until Sean Wong uh, found it with his friends. Yeah. And it's it's really sad. <laughs> like I, I I keep saying that, but it really is. Um, yeah, I mean, John Okada died with this book being an unsuccessful like venture. Like he, he, this was his only book. This was his only book, and from what I have read, when it was announced that his book was going to actually be published, I mean, it's going to be published through a Japanese publisher. Mm-hmm. He was very, very uh, proud of himself. And he was like, oh, man, I'm like, like I want to quit my job. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm so excited for people to read my work. And it's just so tragic that he did not live long enough to see like what an impact it has made in this community and to like uh, – not just other authors who are rising up in in like publishing today, but also like Asian American filmmakers and yeah. Asian American like uh, screenwriters. I mean, it's also a stage play. Yeah, it's a know? stage yeah. play too. And you know, like think about like Allegiance, for example. Mm. That is like it's it's not an adaptation of No No Boy, but like it's part of that. I, I guess canon. Mm-hmm. So it has definitely influenced a lot of different Asian American creators across art forms, and yeah, it's yeah. it's, mm, <laughs> it's <laughs> all I can say is like it's say is like it's sad, it's disappointing. Yeah. I hope we can do better moving it forward. Feels bad, and we hope that you know the the story's still ongoing. You know, there's still like it's it's not as hot as last week, but it's still like we're still waiting for to see what Penguin does. Or, or if they even do anything. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep tracking the story on our Goodreads forum. If there's any updates, we'll let you all know. Uh, but 
on that note, I guess I'll do it for this episode of Books and Boba. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us once again as we talk about mostly book stuff. Mostly book stuff. <laughs> um, if you even made it past the E3 talk, <laughs> I congratulate you. <laughs> and if you want more E3 talk, let's talk on the Goodreads forums, I guess. A uh, reminder once again that our June book club pick is Kafka on the Shore by Haruki Murakami. Uh, looking forward to reading it. Looking forward to, you know, seeing what all the hubbub is about yeah Tell it's a lot a- longer than i thought it would be when i when i got my <laughs> copy i was like oh it's it's thick and how's the font size want to see <laughs> tell me about this cat like oh yeah that's pretty yeah, yeah. It, it's pretty chunky it's a chunky boy <laughs> with, <laughs> with with like very uh narrow margins and i'm I'm a little bit scared because we're halfway <laughs> into June and I haven't started. Oh, we... but I wanted my nice cover, um, so I guess it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I got my shitty uh, Kindle cover, which is fine. I don't really look at it, so I was listening to good. to it on audiobook um, for like the past two days, but like no luck absorbing any of the information. So now. <laughs> I have to go start over again. What's your read? What's your listening speed on audiobook? Uh, for for this one, it was uh one point two five okay. because the narrator just kind of like the cadence was weird when I uh, made it faster. Right. Yeah, I usually go like one point five. One point five. Yeah, that's usually it's like it's enough so that it's faster, but not chipmunk. <laughs> right. Yeah. the The interesting thing about the audiobook, though, they have two narrators. Oh, and I think that's on the same be- track, on the same like audiobook. Yeah, in the same audiobook. Oh. So I'm guessing that's because uh, it alternates uh, perspectives. Oh. I have, uh, I don't know. Like while I was listening to it, I was working, and that was a really bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> like I couldn't focus on anything. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's 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 denser than than our typical read, which. Yeah, at good, least it's not IQ84. That book is 900 pages. I don't think I could ever ever do that for a book club we'll be talking about Kafka on the shore at the end of the month so uh by then you and i will be haruki murakami experts oh yeah yeah <laughs> um thanks again for listening to books and boba uh we are a proud member of the potluck podcast collective a collective of asian american hosted podcast featuring unique voices and stories from the asian diaspora check out our fellow potluck podcast by going to the website www.podcastpotluck.com and special thanks to Visual Communications. This podcast was recorded at the Potluck Podcast Studios, located at the Visual Communications offices in downtown Los Angeles. You can check them out at vcmedia.org. And yeah, on that note, thanks for listening. Rira, I'll see you in a few weeks. Cool. We're still here, and we're going strong. It's an exciting time in Asian America. There are more movies, TV shows, books, and music reflecting us than ever. But all of these represent just a small slice of Asian American culture and experiences. So what do we do? Tell more slices. Asian Americana is a show that explores these slices of distinctly Asian American culture and history. We've talked about how Chinese Americans built California's Sacramento Delta, the art scene turns gallery institution giant robot, a play that explores the lost Cambodian pop music of the 60s and 70s, and, of course, Boba, just to name a few stories. You can find Asian Americana at asianamericana.com or on your podcast app.